today. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Simple. Amen. So we're in Genesis chapter 50, uh, halfway through. We, we did the first half last week. We're going to be starting again in verse 15 in just a minute. But if you remember, last week we were talking about that, that Jacob has been buried. He was taken back to, to the land of, of Canaan. He was buried in the cave along with his, his grandfather Abraham, with his father Isaac. And they buried him there. And then the family that went to bury him, they all go back to Egypt where they are now residing in the land. Their descendants are going to live there for a very long time. But before we get that that far ahead in the story, which would pick up again if we were going straight through the Bible in the book of Exodus, before we get that far ahead, the brothers are nervous in the immediate situation. And they wonder, now that Jacob is dead, now that Jacob is dead, who is going to stop Joseph from getting even? What if he was only kind to us because he loved dad? What if he has lingering resentment? What if he has thoughts of vengeance? And some of us know the situation. If you have a house with more than one child, or you grew up in a house with more than one child, sometimes there'd be some sibling rivalry, negative interactions that never happened when mom and dad weren't home. Some of you remember that, right? You come home and you're like, hey, how'd you guys do? Did you get along? And everyone's like, yeah, it's great. And then about 20 years later, the true story comes out. Yeah, that day we had a real dust up or something happened. Sometimes that because the parent is present, there is peace in the home. When the parent is away, who's to say? You can think of those, those situations where the, the younger child runs and hides behind mom and dad. And the older child is, you just wait. You wait until mom and dad leave. That kind of look that they're trying to convey. And this is what's happening right here. You know the brothers are anxious. They're wondering, is is this forgiveness, is it real? Or was it just we are the beneficiaries of our brother's goodwill towards his dad? But let's read together here in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 15. When Joseph's brothers had seen that their father was dead... They said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back in full for the wrong which we did to him? So they sent instructions to Joseph saying, your father commanded us before he died, saying, this is what you shall say to Joseph. Please forgive, I beg you, the offense of your brothers and the sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the offense of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to keep many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So we see here the brothers come up. They, They have an audience in mass with Joseph. And they say, hey, we know we're back. We just got done dealing with our, all of our shared father, but we actually have a message from him, a message from beyond that he spoke to us ahead of time when this happened, we're unsure. And whether it was given directly or they sought it out, at this point, they, they want to make sure he knows your father's dying wish is that you didn't seek vengeance on us. They said he, he wants an order of protection to make sure that we are, we are still, we're still family even when he's gone. And, and, we, and we see Joseph's response, and it's very telling that he weeps. 
He, 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 we can only fully, not fully know what he's thinking. We can speculate. We're sure that he's sorrowful because they don't recognize that they are forgiven. And I would guess he is sorrowful because it's revealing that just as there has always been, there is still a level of estrangement between himself and his brothers. Some, some of you know this, and families have situations where you had a sibling, you had a parent, you had somebody else, and, and you wanted to be close, but you weren't. And try as, it tries, you might, it just, it just never fully healed. This is better than it was, but you can imagine how, how that would be grievous to him, saying, you're, you're still, there's still a divide between you and between me. But we see a statement here. This doesn't lead him to bitterness. This doesn't lead him to a new hardening of his heart. But rather, he's able to speak truth into their lives and to let them know that he is able to have a good horizontal relationship because he has a good vertical relationship. Sometimes we really forget that. It's going to be impossible for us to have good relationships with the people around us if we are not rightly oriented towards God. It is God alone who can change our hearts, who can set us in the right directions, who can give us the supernatural ability to forgive when it defies all human understanding or expectation or what seems reasonable. But he is able to do correctly by his brothers because his eyes are on God. His statement, am I in the place of God? It's not my place to judge you. You will stand before a righteous judge. That is true. All of us will stand before a righteous judge. We talked about that recently. But he is telling his brothers, but I am not that judge. And that is not my job. Rather, I am going to respond to you way, the way that I should as a person who also will stand before the Heavenly Father. Um, Professor Utley says this was a way, Joseph's way of saying is he saw himself as a part of God's method for preserving Abraham's family. He says, you meant evil against me. He did not cover his brother's sin, but he saw the unseen hand of God in his life and in his circumstances. And, and we wish that we could live by the same faith and see the unseen hand of God. As God meant it for good, we see it all throughout Scripture. We see it in Romans 8, 28 and 29, who says, And we know that all things work together for good, because those who love God are called according to His purpose. Because those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. That his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. See, what Joseph realizes here is that God is for us. We are often very difficult with one another. This world is broken and it is sinful and it is hard. But that does not change the fact that God is for people. He is calling people out of sin, out of judgment, to restoration, to wholeness, and to right relationships, not only with him, but with one another. And beyond what we experience in this life, there is a life which will transcend all of this and is truly life for the complete healing and restoration. God is working it together for good. Sometimes when you're in the middle of a situation, this is a hard verse. I mean, it's an encouraging verse. But it can be a hard verse because you can say to God in your prayers, but I just don't see it. And hopefully in going through Joseph's life, we know it was a long time that perhaps he just couldn't see it. When he was being hauled away um, by the slave traders, when he was in prison for a crime he didn't commit, when he was forgotten for years and years, I'm certain there are many times where he had to wrestle with, but I don't see it. But that does not change the fact that God was working in unseen ways, in unexpected ways, to bring about this mighty salvation upon his family and upon the land of Egypt. God meant it for good. 
And only, only a holy God can take the broken, sinful, horrible actions of man and still pull something good out of it. It's not that what was done was good. It's that God redeemed that situation for the preservation of lives. God is amazing. That he can take us and our limitations and our brokenness and our bad behavior and still accomplish his purposes. And we rejoice in that. And Joseph seems to have an understanding of this. It's a very, a very significant and deep theological understanding that he's communicating. In light of having the right view of God, he is now able to do rightly by his brothers. He tells them what he will do for them. I'm not going to punish you. He would have the authority. He, he is the man in Egypt. But he says, that's not my job. And he doesn't want to punish them. Instead, he wants to bless them and care for them. As Joseph spoke to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? We read this already. We'll read it again. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to keep many people alive. And his response, so therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. What an amazing response. He didn't say, well, dad's not here anymore. I guess we don't have to do the family dinners. We barely can stand each other. Let's just, let's just call it. No, instead he says, I, I will care for you. I will provide for you. And he tries to reassure them and comfort them. That yes, you are forgiven, but you're not just forgiven. You are loved. You are loved. We read on here, it says, Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, and also the sons of Machir, the son of Manasseh, who were born on Joseph's knees. I, I do want to say right here, that, that's an idiom in Hebrew. They were not actually born on his knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die but God will assuredly take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God assuredly take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and they embalmed him and placed him in a coffin in Egypt. And so, just like his father before him, he says, this is not my home. I, I want to be buried in the land that God has given us. Very little of my life was lived there, but I want to be buried in the place that God swore to Abraham. And, and he told the people, you all need to know that that is the land that God will bring you. This is not our home. And so, take my bones when God calls us out of this place and bury them in that land. Pastor Stephen Cole says, as proof of faith, Joseph gave the unusual instructions that he was not to be put into one of the pyramids or some Egyptian tomb, but instead his body was to be kept accessible enough that when Israel went back to Canaan, they were to carry Joseph's bones with them. And we see that this is exactly what happened. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 32, we read this. When Joshua finally goes into the promised land... Many, many years later, it says, The bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, they buried at Shechem, in the plot of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of silver, and which had become an inheritance of the children of Joseph. He was, in, he was indeed buried there. As we look through this, um, obviously, I think some of the, the points of this passage, as we look for application, as we look, what should we do with this, um, should be very obvious. 
We've looked all throughout this text and all throughout the Bible. There's lessons on forgiveness. And, and they come up again. Forgiveness is hard. We've said that, right, many times. Forgiveness is not easy and it's not natural. And it doesn't always seem fair. There's a lot of things which forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not saying it's okay. Forgiveness is not saying that everything is going to go back to how it was before. And we've talked about these things. But forgiveness is important. Because the Bible tells us we must forgive as God has forgiven us. And so once again, if we want to have a right relationship with God, we need to be seeking his will in our relationships with people. You cannot divorce the two. And Jesus makes that very clear in the New Testament. And we, and we see through the person of Joseph, God's character on display. There is not vengeance. There is not resentment. But he's giving blessings. And he gives love. Now make no mistake. There are verses in the Bible which says God is a God of vengeance. And he is a God of justice. But only God perfectly can mix his holiness and his love with justice. Human beings mess that up. And we often don't have the goal of restoration in mind. We have the goal of getting even in mind. And so the things which belong to God, we need to leave to his hands. And we see here, and, and, and I think, of course, of it's not, it's not just... It's not just Joseph we're looking at here, but I, I think our mind should naturally go ahead to... Jesus Christ, to the character of God. And there's some who will say Joseph is a type of Christ. That means prophetically the, the character that we see in him, the things which we saw happen to him are going to be reflected in some manner in the person of Christ. Christ who was rejected by his own. Christ who went through horrible adversity. And Christ who at the, did all of these things in order to bring about restoration and healing and salvation. And when we look at what God says to us, like we read this morning in Jeremiah 29 and 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Now when that verse was written, that's in the book of Jeremiah, it's to the, the Israelites, and they are, they're in captivity for their great and grievous sin. It's not, it's not just a verse that you just put up on your wall. When God is speaking those words, he's saying, you have sinned greatly against me, and you are in the middle of all this judgment, and you're going to be taken to a foreign land, but nevertheless, I am for you. Nevertheless, I have plans of peace and not of evil, of a future and a hope. We see this, this same type of sentiment over and over in different contexts. And the promises may vary. But what we see is that God is for people. Because Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Which is good news because that's all of us. We can look around this room. We can't say, well, most of us need Jesus except for, you know, those of you in the balcony. You're okay. That's not how it works. Sorry, balcony. You're in the same sorry state that all of us are. That we are sinners who need Jesus Christ. And praise God that he stepped into this world darkened by sin and judgment and gave us hope in Jesus Christ for the saving of many lives for those who would accept the provision made in his son. And we rejoice in that. And really, this is a whole message we, we started a long time ago in the book of Genesis because without the book of Genesis, if we don't really understand it, I don't think we fully comprehend why we need a savior. There's a lot of other things we don't understand as well. That the Bible is not just a bunch of morality tales. It does tell us how to live in terms of morality and righteousness. But it's more than that. It is how God lovingly created people to have a relationship with them. And we broke it willingly by choosing sin and self-will and ruined everything. Not the least of which is ourselves. But how God, from the very opening pages of the Bible, began to enact a plan of redemption. Of bringing back salvation, of reversing the clock. And for those who would respond to what is given in Jesus Christ, they would find that life and live in it. 
So what have we looked at? Let's, let's just review really quickly. We're going to use that whole walk through the Bible outline. If you've been to those, to those seminars, this won't be new. Basically, in the book of Genesis, there are, we say, four key events. There are four key people, right? Creation. Creation is event number one. God created the world and everything in it. And he did it intentionally, and it was good. Everything was good. And the pinnacle <coughs> of his creation were human beings, created in his own image. The breath of God breathed into them to give them life. And it says God would walk with them in the cool of the day. We, don't even, we can't even imagine what it must have been like. But then after the creation, the second event was the fall. That's when mankind willingly chose self-will and rebellion over God. And they were, they were kicked out of the garden. That brought physical death in the immediacy that all of us from that time period have a death sentence hanging over our head. Meaning we will die. Eventually, death gets every one of us. But more importantly, even than that, there was spiritual death, which means we were separated from God. And that's even more, more of a situation than the physical death. And then we see the flood. The flood, of course, is a big event. It talks about God's judgment on that ancient world as evil was always increasing on the earth. But also it shows God's preservation that even though people may be judged and die in their sins, that God has not given up on humanity as a whole, but he's preserving for himself a people which will be restored to him and called by his name. And on the ark we see that. Later in the, the rest of the book we see that with Abraham. We see that with the church today and all the people throughout history who have belonged to God and by faith have a relationship with him. After the flood, of course, we saw the dis dispersion of the nations. But out of those nations, then we go to the four key people, which starts with Abraham, because God called for himself a man, Abraham, and gave him the Abrahamic covenant. And he said, I am going to give special blessings on you. There will be a land that you will live in. You will have descendants. There will be a seed and there'll be a promise that through you, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. I don't know that Abraham knew what that was. But one day, one of his great, great, many great grandchildren would be Jesus Christ. And that's why we're here. Even though most of us are part of that dispersal of the nations. I think very few of you in here are Jewish. I think a lot of you are Mennonite. But very few of us have that by, by ancestry. But Jesus Christ is a blessing to every man and woman of every tribe and tongue and nation. And we are here because God's promise to Abraham is being realized to us this day. So it's a, it's a good book. Of course, we go to Isaac. I said four key people. I can't leave after just Abraham. We have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and we've concluded in these last several weeks with Joseph. And we get to see in these people's lives how God actually is working out and how he's preserving his, problems, his promise in the midst of great problems. So I guess we're going to say goodbye to Genesis for now. It's, uh, to me, it's kind of bittersweet. I, I love this book. I love this book because it gives you the history of what God is doing. On the other end of the Bible, and we're not going there right now, so don't get excited, is the book of Revelation. And at the very end chapters, it shows us where we're going. And you don't even have to read all of Revelation, but if you want to know where this started and you want to know where it ends, just go to the last, last two chapters. Because the restoration that God has been doing because of what happened on the earliest pages of the book of Genesis, we have the promise and the proclamation of what will be completed when there is a new heaven and a new earth and we shall walk with God and see him face to face forever and ever. But to close this up properly, the uh, book of Genesis is indeed the book of beginnings. Um, it tells us where we came from, 
how we've gotten to here. Not every detail along the way. It doesn't deal with the French Revolution. It doesn't do, you know, with migratory patterns of all the human people. But it tells us spiritually why we're at where we are at today and spiritually what is important in terms of what God has revealed to us. It shows us what the problem is and it points us to God's proper solution. Um, I think it's important that we make sure that we, we know the Old Testament. You don't need to know the entire Bible cover to cover in terms of perfect proficiency to have a relationship with God because it's by faith alone and Christ alone. That being said, we would have a lot better living out of our faith in Christ if we actually knew what he was teaching us. We'd have a lot better perspective. God's word renews the mind. It restores the soul. It points us on the right direction. And so many times we skip the Old Testament because we rightly have such affection for Jesus Christ, but we miss the whole counsel of the word of God. And some of the things that Jesus says, we don't have in context. He's talking to the Pharisees and we're thinking, I don't know why this is a big deal. Well, it's a big deal because they understood the Old Testament and so should we. And... Uh, we said this at the very first sermon on the book of Genesis. There was a quote by Richard Foster, which I think is worth repeating at the end of the series now. He says, we lack, and he's talking in Christian churches and Christian peoples, we lack a worldview that is a vision of the whole. Today, a form of illiteracy abounds that is especially dangerous precisely because it is not recognized. It is particularly prevalent among those of us who read the Bible regularly, memorize verses, and are committed to the authority of Scripture. He says there's a problem that's even in our Sunday schools. As we teach Bible stories, we often tack on little morals. But that is what they remain. Bible stories with little morals. We never explain how all the pieces fit together, giving a great sense of the flow of holy history. And as I would say, that is what God is doing in this broken world to restore it to himself. Because we talk about history, and yes, it's cliche and it's trying to be cute, but you've also seen that broken up to it's his story. And that's very true, that history is especially biblical history, but in all history, if we look closely enough, is the story of God working in humanity to bring them back out of judgment into relationship with him. It shows us the loving creator who's still working with the people he created to bring about redemption as he works through us and in us. So we've seen the beginning in Genesis. We see the climax in Jesus Christ and the resolution of all things at the end of Revelation. Because even though we meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And he accomplished his goodness to bring about the saving of many lives through Jesus Christ. And that is why we're here. And we thank him for what he has done. And I hope you love him for what he has done. And I hope in view of that, that our right response is to yield ourselves to him fully, that he may have his work completed in us to be about his business. Because the news is, the sad news is, this world is still broken. And those of us who are here, yeah, we're still broken too. We're saved because we've been adopted into the family of God and our, and our position is secure, but we need to learn what it is to live as healthy members of this new family. But there are others out there that still only have their brokenness. Some of them don't even know it. And we want to let them know that there is hope and that there is life and that God is calling people to his name. So with that...